Well, morning, you, uh, we know this, we're in this series called Arise, where we are trying to bring some clarity to our mission and our vision as a church. And so it's my hope, as we walk from here through to the end of this series, that we are going to have some shared language and shared concepts that we're going to walk in as a church. Um, that I, If someone was to say to you, you go to Alliance Bible Church, what does the discipleship process look like there? What is this church all about? We're all going to be able to use the same language to answer that question. So that's the goal. Um, and this is, um, for those who have been around for a while, for those who haven't, uh, just to explain the system, um, Alliance Bible Church went through a 14-month process where an outside group came in to help the church look back on who they were, uh, look at where they were at that point in time, and look ahead to the future. And as a result of that, a report was produced that had strategic initiatives, key values, and things that the church wanted to move into moving forward that launched into the search for a new pastor. And so then, uh, unfortunately for them, they get me. Uh, <laughs> that scrape in the bottom of the barrel. And so for the last year, it's been a process of, of, of learning and listening and watching what God is doing in the church, watching what the church has to offer to the community, having conversations with the, the interim leadership team, with different people here about the heart and vision moving forward. And then on top of that, taking everything that God's put in me over my life of ministry and trying to bring those three separate groups of things together and harmonize them to walk forward. So what, what we're looking at through this series is kind of the harmonizing of the journey that the church has been on and, and bringing like some definitive uh, language to conclude the process that we've been in and begin the new process that we're walking forward in. So I'm hoping you'll see in the things that we're about to share all of the, the language and, and the culture that you've been hoping for. Um, and so the goal today is to begin to bring some clarity of language at the end of the day, because what I'm about to say today is anyone that walks with Jesus should know this stuff, right? Because this is the hope of the church, right? We're going to do what the Bible says, and, and, and then it should be obvious, right? The mission of God is obvious to us, and so we're going to walk into this. So the last two weeks of the series, uh, week one, of this series, we looked at the word arise, and I looked through scripture at different ways it's used, and just said, man, this is a really fun word for a discipleship process. Look at all the ways it's used, what it entails. This is who we want to be as a church. So let's uh, step into this word. Last week, we looked at discipleship as a core concept of the church, and a ministry that we've got to walk in, and, and knowing that Jesus gives us invitation to follow. It's our job as the church to arise and follow him. Um, and so we looked at that last week. This week, I want to begin looking at what we're going to call our principles. So three principles um, that are going to govern and guide the mission that we walk into as a church. And from here, there's kind of a threefold progression that we're going to walk in through the rest of this, this series. Um, so we're going to start uh, this week looking at what we'll call our principles, and there's three of them. Uh, next week, we're going to look at what we'll call our posture. What's the posture that we need to walk in as we do this? Um, and then for the weeks after that, we're going to look at what we're calling our practices. And there are six practices that we're going to engage as a church in various ways um, that are going to shape the way discipleship happens, shape the way mission happens. And the, the principles, the posture, and the practices are going to become the thing that dictates what kind of ministries we step into, what we say yes to. Um, as we're talking through these things, what I'm hoping is going to happen is you're going to have ideas come to mind. And so we're going to have some opportunity coming up to brainstorm together about, okay, if this is a practice that we want to step into and a value that we hold, what are some of the ways that we can do this? What are the resources we have on hand? Uh, what are some of the new resources and gifts that have come into our church that can help us lead this forward? Um, so that's where we're going to, that's where we're going to go. So um, that, that clear? So this is where we're heading. Um, and so I'm going to give kind of, I'm going to focus on the principles. I'm going to give a little summary of some of the other elements as we go to ground us and where we're going. So to begin with, central to the mission of every church are two teachings of Jesus. They're great. One of them we call the great commandment. We call it the great commandment, but he gives two, right? So I put brackets, the great commandments. The other element of it is the great commission. 
Uh, so these two things that Jesus explains that we've labeled great, that are significant to who we are as the church, that should shape the mission of every single church in the world. So this is the unifying part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And the three principles that we're going to look at are going to be taken from these passages, um, as should be the case of every church that you walk into. And if they don't do this, please run out the door as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> including here. Uh, <laughs> so let's look first of all at the, the great commandments just to root us in this passage and remind ourselves of what Jesus said. This is Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? This wasn't a new question. This was a question they would ask rabbis and teachers, like basically, what's the summary? What's the crux of it all? Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So he draws on the Shema of Deuteronomy that they grew up knowing, they recited all the time. The law is summarized in this, love God with everything that you have. Notice he only asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He's like, I'm going to go one better, because there's a second one that you can't separate from the first the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we know this. If you've walked with Jesus, if you've been around the church, we understand that someone comes to Jesus, asks the question, what's the greatest commandment? And he gives two responses. Love God, love people. It's the crux of what we do. We have this vertical pursuit of, of this God that we delight in, who delights in us, and then we take that to the world and we love the people around about us. I have found, though, that when you say, my goal is to love God, love people, it's a little nebulous. We're a little bit like, it's become a little jargony. How do we do that? So we're going to look at how we word those principles in a way that's meaningful as we walk it out. At the end of Jesus' life and ministry, um, we reach the Great Commission. And again, by way of reminder, the 11 disciples, uh, this is Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20, the 11 disciples, Judas has betrayed Jesus. So the 11 are left. They go to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So they're still walking in obedience even after his death. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So I love that part of the passage. There's some grace in there. These people didn't have it all together. They didn't understand everything. Some of them got who he was. Some of them are confused and not understanding. Regardless of how confident their faith was, Jesus comes to them and he says, all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and so I'm going to give it to you. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this, this outward commission, that the job of the church, we love God, we love people, and then we go out into the world to make disciples, leading people to faith in Jesus that's going to result in baptisms, and then helping people mature in their faith by teaching them to obey everything that he's commanded. And then the amazing promise that if we do this, that his presence goes with us. And the one way we can guarantee, I've said this before, if you want the presence of Jesus in your life, one way that you can guarantee experiencing and encountering him is go make disciples. Because if you do it, he'll be with you and you'll encounter his presence. So that puts these, these three pieces, love God, love people, make disciples. It's the crux of everything that the church is called to do. So I want to put up here now some language that I want us to, to use as we walk forward. If someone says to you, I mean, what's the, the, the core simple principles that your church operates in? Uh, these words are, are changed on purpose. Uh, rather than say love God, because a Muslim can tell you they love God, uh, uh, a Baha'i can tell you they love God, a Hindu can tell you they love gods, and surely loving gods is better than loving one, right? Um, so, so we're going to reword this as be true to Christ. And in a minute, we're going to look at this and explain what this means and, and, and why we're choosing this language. Um, love people. I mean, it's very easy to say that, to say that phrase, that like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to love people. Do you know what I find harder? Being kind to people. It, it's the same principle. Uh, there's going to be this fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness. So it's part of the synonymous nature of the fruit of the Spirit to be kind to people. And then lastly, as we've talked about for the whole last series, be sent to the world. If we could get this as a church, if this was all we did walking forward, being a part of Alliance Bible Church means that we're people that are true to Christ, we're kind to people, and we're sent to the world, I think we're doing all right. You agree? <laughs> I think this is a good summary of the mission that we're called to. This, this is not supposed to be rocket science, right? Uh, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to make it super complicated so that you can't do it. He said, I'm making it really simple. Love God, love people, make disciples. So we're going to be true to Christ, kind to people, and then sent to the world. So I want to look at these one at a time and just explain a little bit of the language and just challenge us that though this is simple to say, it's actually very, very hard to do. So the first one, uh, be true to Christ. So, as always, let me flip it as a question. How well are you doing in your spiritual journey right now at being true to Christ? Um, Matthew 16, Jesus is talking with his disciples. We know this conversation. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. How does that sit with American Western autonomous individual rights and freedom thinking? If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. It's non-negotiable. And then take up your cross so it's not enough just to deny the things that you want. Are you willing to suffer and be humiliated and persecuted? If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, the house that you want, the job that you want, the money you want, the relationships that you want, the status that you want, the influencer uh, status that you want? What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So yeah, we can talk about loving God and loving people, and that's great. I'll still use that language. But the call here is, will we be true to Christ? Will your life be a reflection of Him? Like a true reflection. We're all uh, murky, muddy reflections of Jesus. Will we strive as a church to be a true reflection of Him in the world? Are we going to love the way He loved? Are we going to focus on the truth the way that he focused on the truth? Are we going to look at Jesus' life and study it and say, what did he do? What kind of person was he? What kind of people did he spend his life with? And then be true to him in the way that we do that. Are we going to be true in the moments where the world is, is coming against Christian values? Are we going to stand for the things that the Bible tells us to stand for? If the world tells us to deny Christ, are we going to deny Christ like Peter did uh, when a, a small girl, you get the irony of that? This little girl comes walking over to Jesus and he's scared of the little girl. <laughs> uh, do, you were with Jesus? No, Ella, I wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. Uh, you're so scary. In those moments, are we going to be true? Are we going to stand on our convictions? Uh, when the world comes after us and tries to persecute us, uh, imprison us for things that we say, if, if we go overseas to a place where someone, you could lose your life for the gospel, will you be true to Christ? If you were standing with my friend in India and they said, hey, would you baptize this person, knowing that if you walk in that water and you engage in a symbolic act of conversion— the, the government gives the Hindu nationalists around you the right to come and take your life. Will you shy away out of fear, or will you be true to Christ in the moment? This is an easy statement to say, yeah, I'll be true to Christ, but that living this out is difficult. Every decision, every moment. Hey, do you know the hardest one, actually? It's when you wake up in the morning and it's like, you know, I really should make the first act of my day connecting with the creator of the world and the savior of my soul. And it's like, there's 101 other things that need done. I got to shower. I got to get ready. I got to get out. I've got some prep to do before I go. I got to go get gas. Got to talk to my spouse. Got to sort the kids. Will you be true to Christ? 
and give him your first and your best. It's, it's a lot easier said than done. So, so what I'm hoping is, as a church, we'll start asking this question in this moment, am I being true to Christ? And if not, what am I going to do about it? Um, I'm going to kind of just give a little hint about where we're going, because I said there's going to be three principles of posture and six practices. So for each of these, there are two practices that we're going to focus on to help us live out this principle. And so what we're going to do here in, in being true to Christ, this is going to be wrapped up in the practice of prayer. And as a church, we've been trying to lean into intentional prayer, but we're also adding to this uh, a practice of creativity. Why? Because I think the church has lost sight of how we're supposed to be true to Christ in the world. So what we do is we spend most of our time relying on how it was done in the past and getting annoyed when things change. When God's called us to be creative and innovative in the way we take His truth to the world. Um, we worship the Creator God uh, who created everything. He created us diverse. Creativity is about celebrating the diversity of who we are. Every nation, tongue, and tribe coming to the Lord, a diversity of gifts and expressions. You've got intellectuals that want to express Jesus by reading books and teaching classes. You've got activists that want to be creative by getting out there and serving and finding solutions to the brokenness in the world. You've got caregivers whose, whose creati creative expression is making meals and loving people and sitting and having conversation. So, Creativity is a big, broad concept uh, for something I talked about a couple of weeks ago, being constructive in our approach in the world. So as Christians, you're not true to Christ by just being someone that's a naysayer to the way the world is. We're true to Christ when we see the brokenness in the world and we come together as the church to create a solution. And we go out there saying, this thing is broken, let's provide an alternative that is going to provide hope and healing and transformation in the world. So, so we're going to lean into these two expressions um, as the practices that will help us be true to Christ. We'll we be people of prayer in every situation, cultivating daily rhythms that help us engage with Him and listen to Him and minister to other people. And then will we cultivate practices as a community that say we, we're not just going to do things the way they've always been. We're going to rely on the power of the Spirit and the resources that He's given us, and we're going to be creative in the way that we reach the lost, in the way that we minister to the schools, and how we educate one another to walk with Jesus. And, and within that, like worship and art and celebration and interaction and those elements that, that are a I think that we've kind of lost in the church. Um, I'm going to say no on this. I, was, I wasn't going to do this. The Reformation was an amazing part of the history of the church that did lots of damage to the church as well. So there are things that happened in the Reformation. Catholicism had distorted the truth of God. They'd added all of these idols and images uh, and this sort of pantheon of saints that they quote-unquote worship. They added indulgences and these works practices that people had to engage in. And so as Luther comes along and solidifies the unrest that was there, he begins a purifying work within the church. And so in some cases, I would say he threw out the baby with the bathwater. So when you go to Europe and you go to the major cathedrals that existed at the time of the Reformation, you can look at the pillars, and on the pillars there are holes everywhere because Protestants went into the churches and were like, that picture of Jesus is an idol, so they just ripped it off the wall. That artwork over there is a graven image, and so they ripped it off the wall. They took candle stands down. They took the creativity out of the church. And a lot of what's been happening in the last uh, decade, really, in the church, especially the Western church, is the church is rediscovering the role of creativity in our faith. We're rediscovering, like, we hate Hollywood because it's teaching all these lies to our kids, but the church hasn't been producing good quality material to counteract the lies. And now you've got things like The Chosen being produced to articulate Jesus in a creative way in the world. So if we want to be true to Christ, we've got to step into prayer. We've got to recover the role that creativity plays. Um, when we did the, when you, you produced the report as a result of the, the process with Vital Church, one of the values that the church settled on was flexibility. You can't 
go out into the world and say, as the church, we're flexible, right? <laughs> that, that can communicate what, not what we want to communicate. But so what we've done is we've taken that value of flexibility. It's wrapped up inside creativity. Because what is creativity? It's saying, hey, here's something that, that is not working. Let's be flexible. Let's create a different way of doing it. And so, so this really is going to be asking you, be flexible as we practice and express our faith and walk in more creative ways of engaging Jesus. So that's principle number one, be true to Christ. Principle number two, be kind to people. Um, <laughs> and Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then someone asks him the question, well, who is my neighbor? And anyone that grew up in kids' Sunday school knows the story, the story of the Good Samaritan. I've put it up here, Luke chapter 10. A Samaritan, as he traveled, so there's, there's this, uh, this Jewish man is injured and lying on the ground. Um, uh, he's been beat up on this road. A priest walks by and ignores him. A Levite walks by and ignores him. And then the Samaritan, his enemy, walks up and ministers to this guy. But this is the point where we see the Samaritan's kindness at work. The Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity or had compassion for him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Try that one at home. Next time you get a cut, just a little bit of wine on there. Uh, but no one has wine in their house, of course. Because <laughs> uh, Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to him in, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of the three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? I love this story because the question was intended, like who's my neighbor was a question that was intended to say, help me draw the line so I know who I don't have to help. If my neighbor is the person on the right and the left of my house, then all I need to do is be nice to the people on the left and the right, and then we're good. Um, if you say my neighbor is everyone that lives on my street, then there's a little bit more work that I've got to do. Um, if we say my neighbor is all the people that live in the city, I mean, there's more work to be done. But what Jesus does in this moment is he says, being, being a neighbor, who's a neighbor? It's your enemy when they're hurting. It's, it's if you're a Republican, it's a Democrat. If you're a Democrat, it's a Republican. As we're looking at the issues out there in the world, it's the Taliban and the things that they're doing. It's the BJP in India, these governments and situations that are opposed to the values of Jesus. Those are the people that are our neighbor. There is no drawing a line to say this person doesn't count. Um, so Jesus takes the, the command to love your neighbor and uses this story to describe what essentially is acts of kindness. He takes pity on a person that's hurt. He bandages their wounds. Uh, he gives them a little wine. Uh, I wonder if any slipped in his mouth at the same time. He put him on a donkey. He took him to the inn. He, he paid for his expenses. He made sure he was cared for. Um, so the call to be kind to people. This, when I think about this process, this is the part, sadly, that I find the hardest. I find myself rub up against this principle the most. So like, I feel like I'm doing pretty good at being kind to people, at being true to Christ. What about being kind to people? Well, that wasn't very kind the way I just cut that person off in traffic. Or I find myself thinking through a conversation I need to have, and it's like, I've got to be harsh about this. And then I'm driving, you can't say that. That's not kind to people. Um, I'm going to pray in precatory prayers that God will take down the Taliban and burn them all up. I'm like, is that kind to people? God, I pray for their salvation. I pray for their transformation. Um, so will we be people who are kind in the world? I, I just, could you imagine that the world looked at the church and said, you know, when, wh wherever I am in the world, the kindest people are always the Christians. I don't know that that's the, the message and the reputation that we have right now, but could you imagine, like, the best employees I've ever had were always the Christian ones. The best bosses I ever had were always the Christian ones. The best neighbors that I ever lived next to were the Christian ones. The best teachers that my kids have were the Christian ones. So what does it look like if we redeem this reputation by being kind to people? We're going to look at two practices that, that help us in the process of kindness. The first one is hospitality. And we've talked a lot about this, so this, this isn't new. What's it look like to be hospitable people? And we could say, and, and commonly when churches are picking values, we use words like fellowship or community. 
The trouble is when we talk about community, usually what it means is I find people like me and we hang out together and we have fun together. We go deep and it's good. Hospitality as a biblical principle was about entertaining the stranger. It was about someone comes into town and you don't know who they are and they don't have a place to stay, you open your home. So hospitality is a challenge to cross cultural barriers and welcome in people that are other. Um, and it's challenging. And hospitality is more than can I make nice food and can I set up my house well? Hospitality is can I open up space inside myself to make room for this person to, to be known and loved and valued? And so as a church, what does it look like to practice hospitality in the way that we welcome people in to church on a Sunday and, and the ways that we welcome people into our lives and the way we engage with one another? What's it look like in the way we host space for people out there that don't fit in church, that don't value what we value, and in many senses that are opposed to who we are and what we value? What's it look like to be hospitable to those people in the way that Jesus was and in the way that he encouraged? The other set of values or practices here are those tied to the word justice. Justice, I think, has a bad rap in the church. Um, but this is just saying there are things in the world that are broken, and God has a just way that things are meant to be. And part of the Christian journey is to be bringing justice back into the world in a world that is filled with injustice. And it has two elements to justice. One element is what we understand as the criminal justice system, which is consequence being brought to people that are not living the way they're supposed to and that are harming people in the process. So there's a form of justice that needs to be carried out there. And we have all of these amazing scriptures that talk about that, that we, in the end, like God is training us to rule with him as royal priests, so that we are going to be ministers of justice in his kingdom. Um, and so there's, there's the, you could call it corrective justice on one hand, and then on the other side, you've got restorative justice, which is looking at the areas of brokenness, the people who are without voice, the people who are oppressed and hurt. How do we come alongside and help them experience rightness in their life, whether it's healing to people who are broken, whether that means as a church advocating for issues that need to be advocated for because people can't advocate for themselves. Um, and so you put these two things together. How do you welcome people and one another in and create space for one another? And then how do we advocate for one another Another, to make sure our lives are the way they're supposed to be, that we have the resources that we need, and that the church is at the forefront of that rather than uh, relegating the responsibility and outsourcing it to other agencies. What would it look like if the church was known as a place where justice issues were solved? Um, and we see it. I don't, I don't know how much you're aware of what goes on in Oregon. Um, embrace Oregon. Are you familiar with Embrace Oregon? A foster care initiative started by Together PDX um, as a movement to solve the foster care crisis in our city. So the city, the churches went to the city and said, what are some of the biggest issues that you're dealing with? We have so many kids in foster care. The churches said, let's solve this. If we went to the churches and had all the healthy families in our church train up to be foster carers, we could empty the foster care system and put all of those kids in, in good loving homes. And so Embrace Oregon was formed as a way of solving a justice problem. Kids who undeserved have grown up in difficult situations, being put into families and cared for rather than being bounced around in a system. That's the kind of things that we want to do, the, the kind of ministries that we want to partner with um, in solving issues that exist in the world. So will we as a church be kind to people, extending hospitality and advocating for justice where it's needed? The last one, last principle, being sent to the world. I'm, I'm hoping to some degree that you're sick, fed up of hearing me talk about this part. Um, that means I'm saying it enough. Um, we, we did that whole series on it, and, and the core of the Acts series was this commission in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the call was to be sent out. We looked at it last week with Mark chapter 3 as Jesus calls the disciples to be with them and to be sent out into the world. Like this is what we're called to be, is a church who's sent out. Um, I feel like in lots of churches, we work really hard and do a fairly okay job at being true to Christ, 
depending on the church, we do a shoddy job of being kind to people, <laughs> uh, including the people inside our church, right? We can be really bad at being kind to the people sitting in the room. You know the people that you're not very kind to. Uh, and then we can, depending on the church again, we can do a poor job of being sent into the world. So this is one of the areas we're going to have to lean into really heavily. Um, and, and the language that you've used before, which I love, sent to the world from neighbors to nations, right? This is, this is all of it, from the people next door to us all the way to the ends of the earth is where we're being called to, to be sent, not just to do nice things, but to preach the gospel. You'll be my witnesses. This is about preaching and declaring with authority the message of Jesus to a world that is dying without it. And again, there's two practices tied to this. Um, one, on the one hand, learning, and on the other hand, mission. Um, and these are our values that this church has held really well. Um, learning is, is what creates the humble posture that enables us to go into the world. So there's things that we've got to learn as a church, skills that we've got to learn and how to share the gospel effectively. There are skills, the knowledge that we've got to gain around the word and what it teaches and what the theology is and how we're supposed to live it. There's practices that we've got to learn. How do we engage in our spirituality? How do I be a good parent? How do I have an effective marriage? How do I bring healing to someone that's broken? How do we listen well in the church? What does it look like to pray and to pray for healing and to pray for transformation? So there's a learning posture that we have to hold. That learning posture extends to what do the people out there believe? There are camps of people, we say there's the gay people, right? And so we make an assumption that every single person that gets that label believes the same thing, acts the same way. We got to go learn. Like, what do you think? What do you feel? What do you wrestle with? How do you perceive the church? There's the Muslims, and we assume that every Muslim sees things the same way and believes the same way. We got to go out there. We got to learn and listen. We watch people come in from different cultures. Uh, a city like Hillsborough, there's so much diversity within our city. We can reach the nations right here on our own street because of the diversity that's there. But we have to go in with a learning posture. Help me understand where you come from, what you need, where you're broken, where you're hurting, what truths you're lacking, what resources you need. So learning posture is essential to have humility as we walk into the world. And then mission. I mean, it's been such a core part of this church. Our denomination is the Christian and Missionary Alliance because mission is at the heart of everything we do. And this is local in the ways that we serve the schools and minister to our neighbors. But this is the call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. I don't know. There may be people sitting in this room right now that God has put a call on your life to go to the ends of the earth. And our church is going to walk with you and, and discern that call with you. And then we're going to support you as we send you to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. For many of us, it's going to look like short-term mission as we go out into the world to experience other cultures, to be impacted by them, not to impact them as the primary. We go to be impacted by them and then to come alongside and serve in whatever capacity we have. Um, so sent into the world through learning and mission. I think I have this slide with all of them up here. So this is really what, what is our discipleship process here at Alliance Bible Church? It's that we would arise, that we would be true to Christ, that we would be kind to people, that we would be sent to the world, and that we would arise in prayer, and arise in creativity, and arise in hospitality, and arise in justice, and arise in mission, and arise in learning. Uh, and if we can do these things, I think we would have a very well-rounded spiritual experience. And uh, yeah, they're up there. And, and you can look at this list and you can say, if you look at the three principles in the middle, you can ask yourself the question, well, first of all, a good homework exercise is look at everything on here. There's nine things on, on that diagram. Rate yourself from one to 10 in each of the areas. Where are you strong? Where are you weak? Because the areas you're strong are the areas our church needs to tap into your resources to help us become more effective at this. And the areas that you're weak are the areas that you need to invest the most time to be able to live the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to live. So how are you doing in each of these areas? Test yourself. So that's the three principles, true to Christ, kind to people, sent to the world. Next week, we're going to look at the posture in which we're going to do this. And then the following weeks, we're going to look at these practices one at a time. 
and we're going to explore them in a fuller way. And we'll hopefully have a document to give you next week that has this with summaries of each of the values and each of the statements. But um, I've been preparing you for this for a while, and you don't even realize it. Because we have been saying a prayer at the end of every service for months that I'm going to put up on the screen right now. And, uh, and it says this, Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. It's why I love this And if we as a church can internalize this prayer and live it, our faith will be transformed. Our church will be very different. And the reputation we have out there and the impact that we have will be phenomenally different to what we've been experiencing up till now. So, um, as I say, we're going we're gonna to give you uh, this stuff in writing so that you have it to reflect on. We're going to have some times where we're going to gather and say, okay, if we're stepping into prayer, what does prayer look like? What training do we need to be more effective at this? If we want to be about creativity, what do we need to do in this place and outside there to elevate the role that creativity plays in our services? You know, I love when we do this stuff outside with Together PDX. Each of the, through the breaking, we do these worship events and you don't always get to see them in the video, but they have a crew of artists around the city, and while we're worshiping, they're painting, and they're like hearing from God and discerning something relevant to the message, to the worship, and then they put on canvas this image that blows your mind. There's one family in town that I adore. Uh, Mum and daughters do the artwork, but the three of them, they set up a canvas, and they'll all just kind of sit on their own, and one at a time, they all wander over, and one of them starts painting, and the other's painting over here and painting here, and then they end up with this picture. They're not talking about, like, hey, you do this part, and you do this part. They just kind of work together, and this beautiful thing emerges. I'm like, what's that look like for our church to recover our artistic expression in the world and become more creative. Um, so we're going to have discussions. What justice issues is God calling us to step into? Um, what mission fields is he asking us to partner with? Uh, what organizations are there that we're already partnered with or that we've not partnered with yet that walk in these kind of values and engage in these kind of practices that we can partner with to extend this work into the world? So th there's, there's not going to be a test yet. Um, there's, there's no quiz <laughs> for this yet, <laughs> but, but this is it. I want us to get to a place where we'll be able to say, when someone says to you, what is the, the discipleship strategy at Alliance Bible Church? What is Alliance Bible Church about? We have three principles that we're true to Christ, that we're kind to people, that we take the gospel to the nations. Spoiler alert, that we walk in a posture of grace and truth as we do it. And then there's six practices that we focus on, not exclusively, but the ones that we focus on, prayer and creativity, hospitality and justice, learning and mission as we do it in the world. Last little glimpse of how this works. There's two practices for every principle, one that's predominantly inward and one that's predominantly outward. So prayer, we engage with God inwardly, Cre creativity, we express that out into the world being kind to others, hospitality, we welcome in, justice, we move out into the world. Mission, we learn and we educate, and then we go out and we engage in mission. So they're all this breathing in, breathing out, grace and truth, all of these pieces together, capturing the identity that we're going to walk in as we as a church arise into the discipleship calling God has placed on our life.